Unbecoming Robins by Franz Bartolome I remember the first time I had my brawl fight. I was 10 years old. And I don't remember at all why I got into one in the first place. All I know is, I was in the school garden grounds, facing the girl who pulled my hair during our science class. And in the next minute, I was on the actual grounds, pulling her hair too, our hands fighting each other. It was noon. The sun was striking high in the sky, and the clouds were nowhere to be seen. Our classmates were cheering in high-pitched tones. The boys were betting on who would win over who. The girls were screaming at us to stop it. And this all seemed to go endless. With me crying from the pain I was feeling in my hair, when moments later, Mrs. Sanchez, our teacher, pulled us both up and separated us and told us she needed to bring this whole issue to her classroom. A few minutes later, I remembered we were really in her classroom and she was scolding us about what happened. I was still wearing my school bag. My hands were all dirty and so were my shirt and skirt. And the girl was still eyeing me grimly. Moments later, after Mrs. Sanchez's non-ending scolding, our guardians finally appeared in the classroom. And after a few minutes of talking to one another, the teacher let us go home with a follow-up meeting notes to our guardians. It wasn't my proudest moment, and my sister, Rafaela, who acts as my guardian and was six years older than me, doesn't talk about the fight that much when we get home. I figured she was tired from school to dwell further on it. She goes to the same college, high school facility I was attending back then. After a silent dinner shared in her home, she had me go to bed early. While she stayed up studying, I didn't argue about it. I know she was really wrapped up with the high school graduation coming up her way in a few months' time. Our parents are already long gone through an accident back when I was one year old. So it was me and her all this time, since as early as I could remember. I'm glad I was off the hook from all the scolding I could hear from her about the fight, out of all the people. But only did I realize that that brawl fight will shake my childhood and all the emotions I carry through my teenage years. It was a few days after the brawl when I decided to personally apologize to Mrs. Sanchez myself. I had just sprinted up from the stairways, eager to talk to her, approaching her classroom. When I heard her talking in such a low tone, I'd never heard her speak before. The hallway leading up to her room is empty, and there are no students around. But I figured it was because the clock already finishes the classes that usually takes place here, hit four in the afternoon. The rest of the rooms were open, but they were empty, leaving some dim lights glowing from the inside. Miss Sanchez's room is in the far corner of the hall. Upon hearing her continued murmuring, I silently resumed my walk. And when I reached for her room store, I was curious to see if it was close, but it was not locked. 
a mere gap was open enough for someone like me to peep inside i did and i held tightly on the books i was holding beneath my chest when i saw miss sanchez back gently pushing someone to sit on the chair they were at the far end corner of the classroom when she moved away for a bit i tried to fight the urge to gasp out loud when i saw rafaela looking up at miss sanchez her lips parted she looked like she was trying to come up with some air her hair was tussled her shirt was slightly opened and the buttons were unclasped When Miss Sanchez hovered over again, blocking my view, I took a step back from where I was, and my back lay flat on the stone wall, separating the room's door from another, unable to process what I just saw. I could hear Miss Sanchez whispering. It sounded like she was holding her breath. I've dreamed about this exact moment of having you here. All this week, Miss Sanchez whispered. I could get in trouble, but who's to say I'm not looking for one? Miss Sanchez, I could hear Rafaela responding. Stay quiet, baby. I'll take care of you. Upon hearing this, I tried to get back to peeking, and I was breathing hard when I saw Miss Sanchez's head in between Rafaela's neck, her tongue sliding up on Rafaela's throat. My eyes squinted hard trying to get a better look, and my chest was throbbing fast with the rising heartbeat in my pulse. Your skin is so soft, smells so good. Miss Sanchez whispered, her tongue now at Rafaela's earlobe. Rafaela continues panting, her eyes half closed. My head started aching when in the next minute, Miss Sanchez grabbed Rafaela's face and started kissing her cheeks. In a whisper, she claims Rafaela's lips, giving way for the sound of her breathing to be silenced. I whisked myself away from watching what was happening and closed my eyes. I felt a pang of sudden anger in my chest and wanted to storm inside the room and yell. But I found myself running down the stairs my cheeks warming, the images of what I saw in the room were playing in my mind. I went straight home and tucked inside my room. I ignored the paper notes I had in my notebook that my classmate and best friend Jessica left there, telling me to call their phone home so we could try the landline thing. My head was somehow aching, trying to make sense of why I was feeling so angry, so upset, I couldn't focus on anything after what I saw earlier. It was around 8 in the evening when I heard Rafaela coming home, walking into the living room, and I tried to gather myself and work out the courage to blurt out what was consuming me for the last three hours. I walked out of my room and went straight to the kitchen, where I saw her helping herself up with a cup of water. Where have you been? I asked. She turned around and cast me this curious look. When did you start waiting for me? I asked where you've been, I said, ignoring her question. 
my voice firm. I was doing some reading for my subjects in the library, and I forgot the time. Don't tell me shit, I hissed. Her head tilted, her face suddenly alight with anger. What did you say? I said don't tell me shit. I can't help it. My anger is doubling by the minute listening to her lie. I was surprised by how I found these words, and they just come out of me from nowhere. I remembered hearing them from my boy classmates talking badly to each other. You're not doing some reading. I saw you in Miss Sanchez's room. She was pushing herself to you, and you're, you're just letting her. Her features glowed up hearing me and suddenly shifted her jaw tightening, and she avoided my stares. I could feel my eyes tearing up at the emotion erupting in my chest. Why are you lying? Why are you there with her? Why are you letting her touch you? By the way I am hearing myself, I figured I already know the answer to this. I just wanted to hear it from her. It's not of your business. She replied coldly. She's my teacher, and you're a student. She shouldn't touch you that way. Stop it, she caught, turning away, facing the sink. We're not going to talk about this. You should go back to your room. You guys are disgusting. I blurted out. I walked close to where she is and tried to have her look me in the eyes. Is, is that your thing? Kissing teachers? Shut up. You're attracted to her or something? You like her? She walked away from me and paced around and headed towards her room. It's not of your business, she hissed. And before she could enter her room, I blocked the door with my body. My eyes were suddenly glistening with tears that I didn't realize were now falling down my cheeks. Get out of the way, she whispered, her eyes glued to the floor. Why can't you just tell me why you're with her? I asked once again, desperate to hear the answer. Is it because of me? Did you allow her to touch you that way so she, she can let me off the hook from the fight? For the first time that evening, she looked up. And even if she didn't respond... I knew I was right. My heart swelled at the silent confirmation. Before I knew it, she pulled me aside and ran inside her room and closed the door. I followed after her, but the wooden door greets my cheeks slightly, and I groan in desperation. I knocked a couple of times, shouted she should open the door, and when it was clear that she was not going to, I walk a few steps away and turn around, my face warm from crying. I hate you. I hate you so much, I shouted. And I stormed back to my room and closed the door loudly. And I hid in the sheets, crying. I don't know why I'm acting this way. I don't know why I'm feeling angry all of a sudden. I know I don't mean what I said. And I didn't say what I mean. I can't find a reason to thank her when she shouldn't have let that happen. She shouldn't have put herself in that situation just because of me. Just because of what happened. I guess I'm young and I don't know how to handle these things myself. I guess I was confused about going through emotions and trying to give them a name when I haven't learned how to define or even spell them. I let them consume me. And all the confusion and unknown emotions I've been feeling through growing up intensified when I learned years later what to call what I was feeling angry about that night. And learning also years later 
that it was nothing near appropriate towards that sinful moment between my teacher and Rafaela. Jealousy. I remember the first time I saw Rafaela. I was barely young. I think I was around eight years old at the time when a few days after my grandmother Elby passed away, she was 67, suffered from chronic kidney failure. When an old lady named Patricia came by the foster home, I stayed for a day or two, telling me I will start living with her with my sister, Rafaela. I remember how fragile looking Rafaela was when it, we first met. She had this long brown hair and her eyes were brown, round and piercing. And she could not look me in the eyes when we were being introduced by the lady named Patricia. Her skin is fair, she has a square face, and her jaw is strong, which was the first thing I noticed beside her eyes. She was silently sitting from a chair across from me as Patricia and the Foster's home nun were telling me that I shouldn't worry about what home I will start going to live in as Patricia will take get care of me. Things happened fast and by the end of the day I remembered Patricia bringing us both home. A wonderful apartment painted in yellow and blue. And I was happy knowing I have my own room. It's all set up. I have a fancy bed, a set of teddy bears, and a couple of toys. This was all great, but my curiosity gets the buzz of me when I speak out loud the questions I have for dinner. When I asked Patricia if Rafaela was really my sister. Because if she is, why didn't I grow up with her? No, if she's, she's really not your sister. Patricia calmly answered me, holding my hand across the table. We were eating soup and Rafaela was eyeing both of us nonchalantly. Then why didn't you tell me she's my stepsister back there? I asked once again. Then why did you tell me she's my sister back there? I asked once again. Because she is, but only on the paper. Patricia answered once again. And she looked back to Rafaela and then to me. Your mother and Rafaela's father love each other. And so, Rafaela's father has taken you as his own daughter. And from this day on, you're both sharing the same last name, Robbins. Rafaela looks down upon hearing this. Rafaela and Eve Robbins, Patricia continued. And even if you don't share the same blood or the same parents, you both are still considered sisters. I remember shaking my head and hearing this. I don't understand. Patricia smiled. One day, Eve, you will. One day. I shrugged and just went on finishing the soup. This whole home thing with Patricia and Rafaela went on for a year. She sent us both to start attending school, making new friends along the way. It was all going great and well, until Patricia just one day died in her home, with Rafaela finding her unconscious in her bed with a bottle of pills in her hand. It was a gloomy day for both of us. I was nine years old, and Rafaela was 15. The funeral was as silent as it was with my grandmother. 
but unlike the previous one on Patricia's dad, I didn't cry. A few days later, a man in a suit visited us in our home, presenting us with these papers that I don't understand what for. Talking to Rafaela about something that involves her father's will and other stuff. I don't understand what they're generally talking about, but the whole thing has become clear to me back then. Rafaela has started taking responsibility for me and our situation. Being sisters and paper, and the whole setup gave her a welcome nod to early adulting. At adulting, she mostly devotes her time taking care of me, raising me like Patricia. When, upon entering my own kind of adulting, with all the unfamiliar emotions swirling through me, that I realized she was all that I wanted to take care of, too. Not so sisterly. I remembered what my first kiss felt like. I figured I wouldn't consider my first kiss as those ones I shared from my school. Those moments in between lunch breaks, along the hidden hallway, away from the teachers, along with the young lad who nervously takes my face close to him and just presses lips against mine, making me dizzy and squinty-eyed. No, I don't consider that my first kiss. That is nothing but a touch of a guy's lips in mine. I remember having to experience the first real kiss I had when I was about to turn 18. When I stole it from Rafaela, one night she came home drunk. It was around midnight. And I just finished chatting with the girls from the school on the phone when I heard Rafaela walking into the living room. From the stairs, I peeked and saw that she was trying to get rid of the folders she carried from the office. And I could tell she was pretty dizzy when one folder slammed itself halfway to the table and fell flat on the ground. And she didn't bother to pick it up. I went down further in the stairs and watched her walk inside her room, almost falling over. And when she finally reached her door, she yanked it open, and she fell upon trusting it inward. That's when I ran to her side, trying to get her up, trying to lay her down on her bed safely. Rafaela's breath smelled of whiskey, mixed along with her sweat, and she was just murmuring many inaudible words, trying to fight against my arms holding her. Don't. Don't. Please. Stop. She whispers. I tried to calm her down, and as her murmuring subsided and her eyes were closed, I found the liberty to run my fingers through her face, just what I had long wanted to do. This felt like nothing I felt when I did the same thing with districts from school. I feel my chest beating fast and my stomach twirls. I indulge more in the softness of her skin, my arms around her the weight of my body pressed against hers and it felt divine. Rafaela. Upon hearing this, her lips slightly pried open, showing her teeth. And when she tried to come up for a little air, she sticks out her tongue and licks it within her lips. Watching it makes my heart beat faster than it was moments ago. 
and acting on my desires, I claim her lips. It was amazing. I continued kissing her, feeling drunk by the way her lips taste, and growing bolder by the minute I framed her face with my palms and continued nibbling her lips, and I could not get enough of her. I was feeling delirious by her warmth, inhaling her breath, aroused by her unconsciousness, very different from how she usually is when she's awake. At this growing admiration towards her current state, I find myself smothering her with kisses along her jaw and neck, back to her lips, then to her collarbone, on her chest, then back to her lips once again. When I was continuing the kiss, much to my sheer joy, she returned my kisses, and I had to come up with breath in between those exchanges. It was short-lived, and later, still drunk and suddenly unconscious, she breaks the kisses, her face turned to the side. Fitting my need further, I unbutton her shirt, revealing her stomach and her chest, and I kiss her everywhere from there. Only when my hand traveled down to her pants did I stop suddenly getting out of the trance I was in. And looking at her, she was still deep in sleep, faced out. I inhaled a deep breath. I shouldn't behave like this. This is wrong. It shouldn't be like this. I found myself silently weeping moments later, curled next to her, watching as her face heavily sighs in her sleep. As I continue looking at her through the dim light of the lamp, all the memories of my younger years came back along with the unknown emotions I was feeling. And I cannot help but remember exactly the memory of Mrs. Sanchez's tongue in Rafaela's throat and how out of breath Rafaela was at the act. How hauntingly beautiful she looks in that state. Along with it was the memory of me peeking through Raphael's room and watching her change her shirt every time she comes home from school. And why I find it so fascinating, rather than forbidding, liberating, rather than disturbing. Remembering these core memories and revisiting them again with me lying beside her. It all finally makes sense to me why I acted the way I did, why I felt these emotions, and why I cannot just ignore them. I wanted to be in Miss Sanchez's place, with my tongue down Raphael's throat. I wanted to change her shirt myself. I want Raphaela. And I'm in love with her. It feels so wrong. It is scaring the shit out of me. But I'm in love with Rafaela. I'm in love with my sister. And this stopped me from going further earlier. Crying. As I didn't want this thing to happen with only me. Just me. Being awake in the spur of the moment. I want her, Rafaela, to kiss me, touch me, and unbutton me in return. At this thought, I planted a soft kiss on her lips, pushed my body against her further, pulled her arms, and wrapped them around me. I inhaled her smile through the crisp shirt she was wearing, wiping my tears, now smiling pulling her towards me, knowing I have never been this incandescently happy. But the happiness I felt that night was short-lived. 
it became the opposite of what happiness means by the morning. I woke up with an empty space beside me. And remembering that was the void where I held Rafaela close to me last night, I opened my eyes and blink, looking around the room. I thought I was alone until I saw Rafaela's back facing me, sitting at her desk from across the room. She was looking out the window. I could not see her expression. I softly yawn, and remembering what we shared last night, I walk out of the bed smiling and silently walk towards where she was. When I was standing beside her, I wrapped my arms around her shoulders in the form of an embrace, kissing her cheeks. Good morning. Stop this, Eve. I hear her saying, and she softly takes my arms away. I felt a sharp pain in my chest as I watched her get away from me and pace around the room. What's wrong? I said, watching her. You should not be embracing me like that, she whispered. Why not? I said, suddenly hurt by the way she was trying to avoid my stares. We shared the bed last night. We slept to get stop it. Stop that. She paused, her jaw suddenly tightening. Last night was nothing. But, but you kissed me, I whispered, lying. I know I'm not telling the truth, but I can't believe she's denying what we had last night. And what hurts me more is that she looks like she was repulsed by the mere mention of it. I don't have any memory of that, she replied. But if I did, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I was pretty drunk. Such a shitty excuse, Raf. I blurted. I'm sorry. I won't let it happen again, she added. What do you mean you won't let it happen again? I said, what, that I did not let it happen myself? You're still treating me as a kid, which I ain't anymore. And for crying out loud, I'm freaking 17. I inhaled. And a growing animosity over me doubled at the sight of her, still trying to keep her distance away from me. It shouldn't be like this. I walked over to her and caught her face and tried to kiss her. Come on, don't be like this. You can kiss me all you like. I won't mind. I know I am sounding desperate by the minute, but I don't care. I love her. I want us to love each other. You better stop right this second, Eve. She wiggles away from a grip and distances, distances herself from me. And I hated how she does it in a way that reminds me how she's still treating me as a kid, her younger sister. But fuck it, we're not sisters by blood, so I don't know why she's acting this way. There's nothing wrong if ever we hook up together. I don't care about what everyone will say. I ain't bad either. I'm not the kind that someone says no to. Everyone in the school wants me. I'm the dream girl. I'm what everyone wants to hang out with. I'm the standard. But seeing the rejection from watching Rafaela alone, keeping herself at a distance, makes these facts useless, my charm useless, and makes me furious even more. Why are you pushing me away? I ask, my voice shaking. Don't you see how wrong this whole thing is? She replied. We're sisters. We grew up together. I can't erase you growing up. Don't you see how weird this is? No, I whispered. Trying once more to be near her. 
What we had last night was wonderful. It's everything I ever wanted. Please, Ralph, don't push me away. I'm here. I love you. You don't mean that, she got it. I do, Ralph. I always have been in love with you, I said. My tears now suddenly falling out of the emotion I'm feeling. I walked near her, and she again avoided me by going to another corner of the room. Don't come any closer, Eve. You don't know what you're saying. She put a hand to stop me. As I saw this gesture, I stopped in my tracks. I opened my mouth to say something further. But the realization of rejection happening right in front of me tears my heart apart. I can't believe it. She doesn't want me. You should go back to your room. We can talk about this later. She said a few seconds later. No, I finally said, regaining my voice. You don't have to tell me what I should do or what I shouldn't. I'm not a kid anymore. I felt a sense of satisfaction when I saw her eyes meet mine and saw a flash of anger in them upon hearing what I said. We're not going to talk a We're not going to talk about this ever again. You're not going to see me again. Without a plan in my head, with what I just said, I stormed out of the room and I could feel her following me. And when I reached my room, I slammed the door closed. I hear her calling out my name. But remembering how she doesn't want me near her moments earlier has me fetching my bag and started packing my things. Tears are still flowing down my face. When I was finished packing my things, I dialed my friend Jessica. And when she agreed to stay overnight at their home, I gathered my things and went out the door. And Rafaela wasn't there anymore. I quickly rushed downstairs. And when I was heading towards the gate, I saw her following me at the inside entrance door. Watching me, but not making any moves to stop me. This made me more hurt and quickly run away and grab a taxi on the street. And when the driver drove away, I could not help but gasp out loud and cry. I was 17. And I had my first kiss. But I also had my first heartbreak. Both I experienced from none other than my sister. But now that I am 27, 10 years later, I didn't expect that I would still have the same heartbreak, a much more intense one. Still from the same person who I vowed to myself I wouldn't want to see again after that morning that I was 17. The same person I cannot believe I'm still in love with a decade later. Rafaela. This has been the first chapter on simply beginning from Unbecoming Robins.